Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So here is a test of knowledge here. We'll talk about um, yesterday in just a second. So let's go ahead and take a look at the brain stretch. It does tell me who did their notes from yesterday or not. Um, just like I said, um, yesterday I had to go to a funeral. So unfortunately, I was not able to be here. I think I forgot to tell this class. But I, yeah, I apologize. But I had to go to a funeral yesterday from my best friend's grandma and um so yesterday you were to complete those one e notes if you haven't done so not a big deal you're not going to get in trouble or anything just make sure you get those done because everything kind of builds on that there is an old recording and um, that recording, you could just bypass the announcements because it does not pertain to us. It's been the past, but the material in it is still good. So you want to make sure you do um, look at that and complete that just at your, um, the earliest time as possible because you don't want it boggling down. Because it does talk about this endothermic and exothermic processing. It does talk about this stuff. That is on your exam. That is due Thursday. So just kind of make sure you get that in and get that completed. So, um like I said, there's no penalty for being late. Just make sure you get it in. Just make sure you get it done, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. I love the um, trying. I love the participation up there. So let's go ahead and kind of go over it. So when sun dries the sidewalk after a rainstorm, this is what? Now, when you talk about these th um, four different things, melting, deposition, sublimation, those are the ones that are kind of odd. The other two you actually have had some contact with, whether it be in junior high or even in elementary school, um, like upper elementary school. So when we talk about when this, um, when it rains and the sun dries it, well, where does that water go? Well, it evaporates, right? We talk about evaporation or what the fancier word is, is called vaporization. So it, um, the heat, the sun from the heat or the heat from the sun warms up that water and then actually it phase changes into a gas to become water vapor which is vaporization so excellent job there everybody now let's take a look at this exo and endothermic processing so if a thermal energy is absorbed causing the temperature to increase and particles to move faster this is what so think about it when something absorbs it's taking it in right a sponge will absorb water. Um, we, you know, when we absorb, um, you know, material or when we absorb the sun, we could be out the sun and it just like warms us up, right? So that energy is coming in. And obviously, if that energy, whatever type of energy it is, whether it be heat energy, thermal energy or what, it increases the temperature of the um, particles. For example, if I was to put a pot of water on the stove and I put on thermal energy, which is giving it heat, okay, the temperature is going to increase. It's going to start to bubble. Well, when it starts to bubble, those particles start moving faster. And so then obviously it then phase changes into another phase like steam. Okay. So if heat enters, and this is where you kind of look at this stuff when you talk about endothermic and exothermic processing, heat enters. Well, enters is the same beginning as endo so it would be then an endothermic process so nice job everybody if it was heat was being released that means that heat is exiting well exit and exo begin the same way that's how i remember it and so that's how you kind of remember these processes we're going to see these processes again but we're going to call them um, exo and endothermic reactions later on okay all right so with that being said yeah, no worries there, Kaylin, no worries. Yeah, no worries, no worries. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Like I said, make sure you get those um, notes in as soon as you can. Again, there is no penalty for you to, um, you know, get them in late or anything else. If you didn't realize that you were supposed to, not a big deal. Just make sure you get them in so you kind of understand the material that we are going to build on. So your notes are in the chat box there. Go ahead and start opening those up as I go through announcements. Remember, Class Connect sessions are recorded and distributed for learning purposes. Please do not put any personal information or information of others into the chat box for your protection and the protection of others. Make sure you're school appropriate and respectful at all times. And like I always say is make sure you are participating. I can't stress that enough. The more you participate, the more you get out of class, the more you get out of class, well, the better things are. The better your grade is, the better you understand everything. 
So keep on participating. Challenge yourself if you're not a person that participates. It's okay. Challenge yourself in here. Be comfortable in here. Um, I more than welcome it. So challenge yourself in here, and then maybe you'll be able to um, take it on. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our calendar. So it is kind of in the still the beginning of week two. I cannot believe it. We're just chugging along here. We have 10 more weeks of a tw our 12 weeks together. It is day 10 of our 61-day adventure. It is Tuesday, March 19th, and we are going to be taking a look at our 1F notes, Matter and Energy. Now, if you take a look at the big picture here, this is the last lesson that we are going to talk about in Unit 1, Structures and Properties of Matter. We are going to be going on to our... Um, um, you know, periodic table unit, which is a long unit, um, next, um, actually tomorrow. And so um, just a reminder that we are, um, our food exam is due Thursday, March 21st. So after today, you should have the ability to complete that exam and look up any of these lessons on any question that you get stuck on, because they'll um, correlate with that lesson. And you'll have a very good understanding of it. If for some reason you don't, that's okay. Just go ahead and email me. Just take a screenshot. You could even um, take a, t a text message, take a picture, and let me know so I can go ahead and help you out with that particular question if you have a um, if you're getting held up. Okay. So I don't want you to get frustrated. I want you to be successful. So if you get stuck on a question and you've gone back into the lesson, you're still like, I don't know the under I don't understand this question. Then you're gonna go ahead and just text message me and we'll go ahead and work it out together okay this is like I said this is due Thursday March 21st okay now if you haven't started it it's still plenty of time don't worry you should still be able to do it and be fine okay all right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to learn today. We're going to define and apply what we call conservation of matter and energy. We're going to define thermal energy, heat of fusion, and what we call heat of vaporization. These are, the, these are like the middle stages of any phase change. We're going to explain how thermal energy affects particles when matter is in a single state. We've kind of already talked about that, we, so it's, it will be a review for us. And then um, we've already talked about endo and exothermic processes. This is one we probably won't touch on this very much, but maybe just a a little bit but I wanted to put it in there okay so let's go ahead and continue opening up those notes I'm gonna give everybody just another 20 seconds up on the clock 20 seconds go 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 all right excellent so let's go ahead and take a look who we have here so make sure again if you've opened up those notes get those hands up there um, Zadine, let's see, um, it's okay, Michael and Mateo, let's see, Mariah and Leal, Junior and Jasmine, Jason and Isis, Gavin and Elijah, Edgar and Chris, and Alex. Make sure you get those hands up there. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. Let's go ahead and move on down here. Thank you, Mariah. I saw your hand popping up there. Beautiful. So let's take a look at our first thing that we're going to learn about, which is the conservation of matter and energy. Now, we know matter is all around us, right? We talked about that from day one. Matter is all around us. So matter and energy do not mysteriously appear and disappear in the universe. I am not Harry Potter. It does not, I cannot wave a magic wand and it cannot reappear or appear whatever I want to. That is what we call conservation of matter and energy. Now, when matter changes a form, there is no increase or decrease in that amount. Okay. It's just changing a form. For example, the um, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Okay. We cannot create it nor destroy it. We can't wave our magic wand and um, create something but it can be what we call converted or changed into a different form or what we're talking about is transferred to a different location okay let's talk about that because there is two examples in this example up here obviously we're talking about how matter can be converted into and transferred into a different form okay so if I have two hydrogen atoms and I have oxygen atoms here, if I bring them together, I'm going to create something different. I'm still going to have the same amount. I'm going to have hydrogen and I'm going to have oxygen. Nothing of that has been created nor destroyed. It has been just transferred, creating into a different form. And in this case, it has been created into liquid. Two gases have now created liquid. Again, still, still hydrogen and oxygen, but now have created into something different. When we take a look at this light bulb down here, this is where um, 
matter or energy has been um, transferred to a different location. Okay, has been transferred to a different location. For example, electrical energy will come into the light bulb. Now, what will happen to that light bulb is obviously we know that the light bulb will turn on, right? Well, when it turns on, it is then trans or it is um, transferred to light energy and heat energy. Now, light and heat do not are um, are not the same thing, but just happen to come to um, happen to have be the same thing when not the same thing, but happen to partake in this process okay so that is that so that's where again it can be converted or change into a different form which is up here or be transferred to a different location now the total quantity of matter and this is important here and i'm going to um, underline this the total quantity of matter and energy in the universe is fixed okay because of this theory of conservation of matter and energy where we can neither create nor destroy, all total quantity of matter in this universe is going to be fixed, okay, is going to be fixed. All right, let's go ahead and grab number two. I'm going to give you just about 25 more seconds to get that one in. All righty. Make sure once you have that in there, the word is converted. So C-O-N-V-E-R-T-E-D. Don't forget the E-D there. Don't just put convert because then I'll mark it wrong. It's converted, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-E-D, okay? Make sure you raise your hand. So Alex and Chris, Edgar and Elijah, Gavin and Isis, Jason and Jasmine, Junior and Lizzie, Logan and Mariah, perfect, nice job everybody, Valerie, Michael and Mateo, all right, perfect. Let's go ahead and move on down. So I'm going to kind of um, go over and practice and show you how this energy or energy, yeah, this energy can be transferred into different locations, but again, neither created nor destroyed. It's just being transferred into a different location. Now, this is something that you may have remembered back in physics when we talked about energy, okay? Now, we know the unit of energy is joules, and hopefully you remember that from physics. So there are two types of mechanical energy here, and that is what we call potential energy and kinetic energy. And the word again, kinetic, just means motion. Well, potential is that stored energy an object has due to its height, okay? Now, kinetic energy has to do with motion, so it's the energy an object has due to because of its motion. Now, if you take a look here at, you know, number three and this question, how much total energy does a skier have at every point? Well, let's go ahead and look at this. Now, the full total uh, potential energy is 50,000 joules. There's no kinetic energy because this skier is at the very top, at the very highest point on this mountain, and, it, it, and that skier is not moving. So that's 50,000 joules of potential energy. Now, if you take a look here, as the skier starts going down here, and you look at that, the potential energy is going to transfer to kinetic energy. Now, if I add these two things up, okay, and remember this total mechanical energy portion of our physics lesson, I'm going to still get 50K, okay, 50,000. Okay, now... As the skier goes down and dips into this like little valley here, and we know that there is going to be more kinetic energy than potential energy, but there's still potential energy because there's still some height, okay? There's still some height. If I add 35 and 15 up, I'm still going to get 50, okay? Then as the skier makes its jump, woo, and it starts creating more potential energy because it's getting higher, but it's still in motion, and if I add this up again, Okay, if I add this up again, then I'm going to know I'm going to get 50,000 joules of energy. And at the very bottom, again, at the very lowest point of that hill or that mountain where there is no more potential energy, there is no more height, and I am going the fastest, I have 50,000 joules. All through this point, from beginning to end, I still have, cre I still have had 50,000 joules. It has only been transferred through all these different portions.
okay? So again, total mechanical energy. We talked about that in physics. All right, with that being said, looking at number three here, I want you to go ahead and lock in number three. Now, what's interesting about number three, and I'll help you out with this one, let me just go ahead and get into my notes here, is we are going to be going ahead and, I'm gonna sneeze real fast. <coughs> oh, all right. So for number three, what we're going to be doing here is we are going to be putting it in as, thank you, Logan. <laughs> it just like came on really fast. We are going to put in what the question asks us, and that is going to be 50,000 joules. I'm going to go ahead and show you how to put this in, and then we're going to, um, I want you to go ahead and lock it in. So right there, you're going to go ahead and put 50, one, two, three and our units are going to be a capital J, okay? There you go. Go ahead and lock in number three. I'm gonna give you about 25 seconds. Take a look up at the board and how I put it into the notes right there. So 25 seconds, raise your hand when you are finished. Good, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Hope. <laughs> All right, beautiful. So again, you're just gonna put 50,000 into the units because we're answering this question, how much total energy does the skier have at every point? Well, like I talked about, total mechanical energy, every point total, that skier will have 50,000 joules, okay, 50,000. All right. Excellent job. Just checking in with a few of us, Zadine and Valerie, Michael and Maya. Perfect. Alex and Amir, Chris and Edgar, Elijah and Gavin. Emmanuel, um, Isis, Jackie and Jason, Junior and Leal, Mariah. All right, beautiful. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Let me grab our list here. All right, excellent. So now that we understand that, let's go ahead and talk about this one. Now, which of these statements is true about conservation of matter and energy? Or excuse me, which of these statements about the conservation of matter and energy is false? Which one is wrong? So I want you to refer back to your notes in number um, two. So is it A? And again, no um, answers in the public chat, but you could always check your answers with me in the question and answers. Just let me know. Is it A, energy and matter cannot be created nor destroyed? Look back at question number two to help you out. Is it B, the total quantity of energy and matter in the universe can change? Is it C, energy can be converted to different forms? Or D, matter can undergo reactions to form a different substance? I want you to go ahead and answer that from your um, into your notes. Remember, refer to your notes for number two to help you out. Which one is wrong? Which one is wrong in this one? All right, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to go ahead and get this done. 30 seconds up on the clock. Here we go. Which one is wrong? Look at question number two to help you out. Um, Kaylin, that one, it, um, take a look again. Sorry, it was supposed to be for somebody else. And then, uh, let's see, Nicholas, you are correct. Yes, Nicholas, you're correct. And for some reason, my computer just decided to go on that. Nat, you are correct. Good, Hope, that could be, that is correct. Take a look again at number two there, Lizzie. Which one is wrong? Which one is wrong? And I'll even go back. Here, I'll even go back to this slide here. So take a look, which one is wrong? Uh, 
That's what we're looking for for question number four. Go look again, Kaylin. This one's a toughie. So take a look. Yes, good, Chloe. Nice, Lizzie. Now you got it. Good, Lizzie. You got it. Excellent. Good, Kaylin. Now you got it. Excellent. Good. All right. Good, good, good. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Beautiful job, everybody. And like I said, I can always come back if you need me to at the end of class. So let's take a look at this brainstorm. Now, we all have that maybe have seen or maybe have done ourselves if we are cooks in our family. I am definitely not a cook in our family. Uh, my husband is. I, I don't really know how to cook and I don't really enjoy it for some reason. But why does food need to be cooked to a certain temperature? That's something that's kind of obvious, but what are some reasons, let me know in the chat box, why we want to cook food to a certain temperature? Why do so we think you don't get sick? Exactly, Hope. Good. That's probably the number one reason. What else is the um a reason why we want to go ahead and cook food to a certain temperature? You don't, you don't get, get salmonella. salmonella. Yep, that's again kind of falls under that. You don't want to get sick. And I've had salmonella and it's awful. Yes. And Jackie, exactly. Tastes better, right? Who wants a um who wants a raw chicken? Ugh. I don't even like touching the raw chicken. It kind of creeps me out a little bit, you know? Exactly. It takes better. You don't want to get sick. There's bacteria in food. It feels funny. That's right, Jackie. It feels a little funny, right? There's no way that I, um, like I said, even um, beef or anything like that, it kind of feels weird, right? And um, obviously, uh, obviously goes back to that bacteria. You want to make sure that you kill off that bacteria and um, you don't get sick. You definitely don't want to get sick from any food. And some of us may have had food poisoning or had um, salmonella. Not fun whatsoever. Not fun. All right. So yeah, exactly. There's some health reasons why we want to do that. So what instrument do we use to measure that temperature of that food? What do you think? Thermometer. Yes, good. Good, excellent. Yeah, a thermometer. So one of these. Now I have bought my own because my husband actually got mad at me because I changed the um, Fahrenheit to Celsius and he was cooking meat and he, would, he was like freaking out. He's like, it's not cooking. It's not cooking. Well, then he fi figured out it was at Celsius and I got in trouble. So he bought me one of these, but yeah, it's a thermometer. I use these a lot in my um, practice here in chemistry, but this is a thermometer. And we're going to talk a little bit about this thermometer in just a second, but we use this to make sure our food is um cooked correctly and beyond those points up there of that heat point because we again that point is where it's supposed to kill the bacteria that is in that food okay naturally bacteria isn't anything so you got to kill it to make sure that we it is edible so let's take a look at this a little bit and again we've already talked about this so i'm not gonna i'm just gonna quickly breeze through this about thermal energy and temperature we know that thermal energy is the total kinetic energy of particles. Temperature is that average kinetic energy of particles. It's that indirect um, representation of whether something is hot or cold. And then heat is the transfer of energy. Remember, energy is conserved but still is converted to different forms or can be transferred. So when we have something like this, we have a cup and a bigger bucket, same, um, same degrees, 25 degrees Celsius of water, and I heat it up the same way. Not yet there, Kaylin. Not yet. So we um, heat it up the same way. Obviously, because of the volume, I'm going to get warm water here. Now, because of the smaller volume of that cup, I'm going to get hot water simply because there's less particles so they can move faster than the bigger bucket. Okay. So that is just the review of that thermal energy and temperature. But now we're going to talk about how temperature and phase changes and what happens during that. Now, during a phase change, that's between like a solid and a liquid, or from a liquid to a gas, okay, where there are two phases, actually temperature does not increase. Interesting enough, okay? Now, thermal energy is only used to separate the particles. That means heat energy is only used to separate the particles. As soon as that it has both solid and liquid, and that we call the heat of fusion. Once that temperature is then rise, then it has gone into the phase change of a liquid, okay? 
And then obviously the same thing happens when I have liquid and a gas. Until that is, um, until I have no more liquid because of the heat, then I have a gas. Now, only once a substance is in a single phase, like a single solid or single liquid or single gas, then thermal energy starts to increase the speed of the particles. Which, obviously, if you're going to have more motion of uh, um, particles, then you're going to have more temperature. You're going to have an increase in temperature. So let's take a look here. When there's both phases, no temperature change. Okay? And when you look at heat of fusion, when you're between a solid and liquid, think of ice. Okay? When I have ice and I have a big old glass of ice water, it's going to be zero degrees Celsius no matter what. It's going to be zero degrees Celsius. Okay? And when I have a single phase like this, okay, this is called a phase change. Okay? And when I have a single phase, then I notice that the thermal energy starts to increase. That's the heat energy. And then obviously we have an increase in temperature. Okay. All right. Go ahead and grab five and six. I'm going to actually give you about 30 seconds to get that one in. I'll give you a couple more seconds. All righty. Just taking a look here. Alex and Chris, Elijah and Gavin, Emmanuel, um, Isis and Jackie, Jason and Jasmine, Junior, Lizzie, Logan, Leal. Perfect. I'm seeing everybody moving up. Mariah. Um, Mariah, number four was a complete on your own. I can go back at the end of class to um, go over it with you, okay? Not a problem. Just remind me, okay? Mateo and Michael. Um, Valerie. Kitali. Kitalali. <laughs> Again, I apologize, my friend. Um, Zidane. Make sure you get that in there. Get that up there. Oh, okay. No worries, Jackie. No worries. I'm going to actually show you an example. We're going to do a live demonstration of this. So that may help you out a little bit, okay? So when you have a solid and a liquid, you're not going to have any temperature change. It's actually going to be the same. But when you have just a regular solid, when you I just have a regular ice cube, it's going to increase because eventually it will melt, right? The temperature will increase because it's going to melt if I just lay it out on the, you know, on the counter. Same thing with a liquid. Eventually that liquid's going to evaporate, right? If I just have a liquid spot on my counter. So as you have a single phase, it's going to um, it's going to eventually rise in temperature to go into the next one. Now, when you are in between it, like if you have boiling water, that boiling water is always going to be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. This may help you out as um, we talk about this, especially during these phase changes. Now, we know a food thermometer is used to measure the temperature of our food and ensure that it makes sure our food is cooked correctly so that we don't get, um, you know, get sick, right? Now, what if our thermometer is wrong? How do we measure to make sure our thermometer is wrong? Well, it's because of this phase change that we could actually measure to make sure our thermometer is correct. Now, the connection is that we can calibrate by using ice water. Since melting, Solid and liquid is always zero degrees Celsius, okay? So I'm going to show you a phase change, and then we could also do it the same way if we um, did it with boiling water. It would still be 100 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and um, switch my camera views. And I'm going to make myself bigger, okay? And I will, I will definitely um, go ahead and focus in just a tad. So... Right here, I have a phase change. Why do I have a phase change? Well, because I have ice and I have a liquid, right? I have two states of matter, right? When I talk about states of matter, I'm talking about solid, liquid, and gas, right? Well, I have two of them. I have a solid, which is the ice, and I have a liquid, which is the water, the actual water water, okay? Now, we're going to calibrate this because, remember, I said um, during two phases, there is going to be no temperature change. It should read on my thermometer 
zero degrees Celsius. So we're going to go ahead and test that theory. And I have a digital one so we can all see it. And as you can see right now, it reads 11 degrees Celsius, right? 11.4. And that's just kind of, you know, out here. And so now I'm going to dip this thermometer into this um, phase change, which I have a solid and a liquid, ice and liquid water, and it should come out to zero degrees Celsius. Let's see how accurate my thermometer is. Now I'm going to raise it up just a tad. And as you can see, if you look into it, now when it says 0 0.8, it's really going to be, it's, it's close enough to just zero, right? As you can see, that during this phase change, it is zero degrees Celsius. If I did the same thing in hot water, then I should have 100 degrees Celsius. If I have water and steam, yeah, exactly, Jackie. If I have water and steam, that is both a gas and a liquid during the same phase. Well, when I have two phases, I should have 100 degrees Celsius. So this is a pretty accurate thermometer. Thank goodness, right? At 0 0.9 degrees, it's still at zero. And you want to look at the big number. You're still close enough to zero. That's where you have a phase change. Now, if I was to take one of these ice cubes out and have it into my hand, then obviously, once it gets into a liquid, it is now created a, um, it is now in a single phase. Okay. Does that help people who un to understand this a little bit better? Okay, good, good, excellent, excellent. That's exactly what I want to see. Now, let's go ahead and head on back and take a look at this um, slide here. So, like I just showed you, this is the example I just showed you right now, okay? This is that ice water, right? I just showed you. Okay, that's okay, Jackie, that's okay. So right here is that ice water, okay? always zero degrees Celsius. I just showed you with my thermometer, when I put my thermometer into the ice water, it's going to be zero degrees Celsius. If I was to have a boiling um, pot of water on the stove, it's not gonna raise in temperature, but only go to 100 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, anytime you have a single phase, right here, if I had a, this would be my ice cube, Okay, I take it out, that's a single phase. That's an ice cube, that's ice, it's solid. Now at this point right now, I am going to raise the temperature of that ice cube. And as you can see, it's starting to melt in my hand because of the heat of my hand. It's now, that temperature is rising from that ice cube because of the heat in my hand. And eventually right now, it's kind of in a phase change because I still have the ice cube and I still have liquid. Now, eventually, if I keep holding this ice cube in my hand as it freezes my hand off, it will eventually turn to all, um, all liquid. Then that becomes a single phase, okay? Now, eventually too, that liquid, if I keep it here, eventually that liquid's going to evaporate into the air because the air is gonna be warmer. And then that will become a single phase, okay? So a single phase is simply just a, you know, a solid, a liquid, and a gas. That's when the temperature rises. That's when thermal energy, when the particles start moving a little bit faster, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, I'm gonna help you out with the first um, couple, okay? I'm gonna help you out with the first couple. The um, rest of them are, you're gonna do on your own. Or actually, no, let's practice this. This is not going to be an on your own. I thought it was, but it's not. So I want you to go ahead and grab your line tools, grab your um, grab your highlighter tool, grab your um, pencil tool, whatever. And I want you to match up a phase change where two states coexist. What is happening? Okay. And then what is a single phase where you have a one state or one single phase? what is happening, and then heat of fusion and heat of vaporization, okay? All right, go ahead and grab that, and then we'll go over it. I'm just going to give you about 15 seconds to do that. Good, good. Excellent. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put our whiteboard tools on hold here. Let's go over it. You've done a very good job. I see some corrections, so excellent job. Here we go. So 
let's take a look at heat or phase change. That's when we have two states coexist. Now remember, a, a state of um, matter is a solid, liquid, and a gas. So when I have two of those in this at the same time, like ice water, I have a solid and I have a liquid, that is going to be two states. Remember our little demonstration is where that, that is where energy is used to separate particles, but it does not increase in temperature. I measure that at zero degrees Celsius, right? If I did a boiling pot of water and it got to where it was steaming, I would have 100 degrees Celsius because I have both states. I have a gas and I have a liquid, all right? Now, a single phase is when energy is used to increase the speed of particles. I'm going to use energy, thermal or, you know, heat energy to increase the particles of that state. Now, what happens is, is I'm using heat energy to increase the particles. The particles start moving faster, then it obviously increases the temperature, okay? Now, heat of, fu heat of fusion is when you have um, a solid and a liquid. Heat of vaporization is when you have a liquid and a gas. This makes more sense when you vaporize something. Yeah, it's going to go from liquid to a gas. Like, um, you know, the water on the ground, when the sun comes out after it rains, it's going to um, evaporate. So that makes a little bit more sense. But heat of fusion actually is between a solid and a liquid. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give you 30 seconds. I know time is of the essence here. 30 seconds up on the clock. Then we'll go, go ahead and close out class. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, hanging in there with me. So 30 seconds up on the clock. Go, go, go. Yes, absolutely. Kit Lali. <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm, you're, it's gonna be a challenge, but I'm gonna take it. <laughs> all righty, all righty. Yeah, you can, Nat, now you can. All right, so with that being said, excellent job, everybody. Because of time, I'm gonna go ahead and just close this out. I will go back, there's a few people that need me to go back to a couple questions, I will be happy to do that. So today, we talked about the conservation of matter and energy. We um, talked about um, thermal energy, heat of fusion, and heat of vaporization. We talked about how thermal energy affects particles in a single state. And then um, with that being said, if you can right now, go ahead and submit your notes. Once you've submitted your notes, you are free to go. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I will see you back here tomorrow. And I know there's a few people... Um, okay, good, Jackie. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but... Um, it, it does take some think about it. And then if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, Jackie. And then let me go ahead and head on back for a few people. I know um, somebody needed number three.